Welcome to ITIL Practices Part 1 module. By the end of this module, you'll be able to recall the purpose of relationship management and supplier management. Now let's turn to the final component of the ITIL service value system, the practices. The first thing to consider is the difference and the relationship between a process and a practice. Since its beginning, an integrated framework of processes has been at the core of the ITIL approach, and it still is. However, ITIL has also long advocated a holistic approach to service management, and this is reflected in ITIL 4 in its focus on service management practices. A practice is, in effect, an organisational capability. As the definition more fully states, it is a set of organisational resources designed for performing work or accomplishing an objective. A process model will be at the core of each practice, but to establish an effective practice, all of the four dimensions must be considered. Consider incident management. The primary process involved is restoring normal service following a service incident. This is too important a matter to be left to chance so an organisation will want to implement a defined process for responding to incidents in order to ensure a methodical, consistent approach is adopted. This will involve, for example, mapping out a process model or models for the different types of incident and documenting more detailed guidance in procedure-level documentation and work instructions. But a practice will only be as good as the people involved in it Having the right people in the right place, doing the right things, involves thinking about things like training and recruitment, team structures and individual roles and responsibilities. The available toolset will either serve to enable or constrain the practice. For example, an organisation can choose to conduct incident management using spreadsheets and email, but this will limit the benefits they are able to achieve. Good people can mitigate the impact of poor tools, but not completely, and not forever. The right people with the right skills, culture and tools can have a transformative impact on success. Finally, for many service providers, some incident management activities will involve external organisations. For example, the service provider may have chosen to outsource the service desk, which is a separate ITIL practice but one which plays a major role in the incident management practice. Or they may escalate some issues to third-party organisations for investigation and correction. The incident management practice is only as strong as its weakest link. The service provided must ensure that any partner or supplier is fully engaged and integrated into the practice to the extent that, from a customer or use view, there is no visible join. It is a seamless practice. As shown on the screen, ITIL describes 34 management practices. But do not be alarmed, they're not all in scope for the ITIL Foundation examination, and we will only be considering the practices which are. These 15 practices are the ones now highlighted on the screen. You will notice that the practices are split into three groups. This is also something you will not need to remember for the examination, but for clarification, the rationale for the different groups is as follows. General management practices are those that originated in business management domains and have been adopted and adapted for service management. Service management practices originated in the IT service management domain through frameworks such as ITIL. Technical management practices have been adapted from technology domains. For service management purposes, shifting their focus from technology solutions to IT services. Before we look at the individual practices, it will be useful to consider the syllabus requirements. More than 50% of the available marks in the exam relate to this portion of the material. So, what does the syllabus expect? Section 6 of the syllabus states that exam candidates should be able to recall the purpose of the 15 ITIL practices listed here. In addition, Candidates should be able to recall the definitions of the seven ITIL terms shown. 
Section 7 of the syllabus requires seven of these practices to be understood in more detail, but we will address those later. For now, we will focus on the eight practices and associated terms shown on the screen now. The first practice we will consider is relationship management. The purpose of relationship management is to establish and nurture the links between the organisation and its stakeholders at strategic and tactical levels. Service providers focus most of their efforts on their relationships with service consumers. This is natural and usually appropriate. We discussed earlier how important the service relationship between the service provider and service consumer organisation is to the health of the service and the co-creation of value. However, relationship management should be applied appropriately to all stakeholders, internal and external. These can include, for example, internal teams, managers and executives, partners and suppliers, shareholders, auditors, governments and regulators. There are a number of other practices that play a part in maintaining consumer relationships, including, for example, service desk and service level management. But by focusing at the strategic and tactical levels, relationship management addresses the longer-term health of the relationships, ensuring the organization's position as the service provider of choice for the consumer. Do you know who is responsible for relationship management in your own organization? Often, these roles have job titles such as Business Relationship Manager or Account Manager. Individuals in these roles seek to develop deep insight into the consumer's organisation and business model, strategic drivers, goals and objectives, in order to better understand the customer's perception of value. This enables relationship management to ensure that stakeholders' needs and drivers are clearly understood and prioritised, including customer requirements and priorities for new and changed services and products. It ensures that the products and services delivered facilitate value creation for both the service consumers and service provider organisations. And it ensures that high levels of stakeholder satisfaction are achieved and maintained. Next, let's consider the supplier management practice. In the 17th century, the English poet John Donne famously wrote that no man is an island. How appropriate is that sentiment for businesses operating in the high-paced, digitally connected world of the 21st century? In business today, it would be rare indeed to find an organisation that doesn't depend, to some extent, on products or services provided by other organisations. An organization's sourcing strategy will define which of the organization's resources should be created and managed internally and which may be obtained from and or managed by third parties. Some organizations may choose to make extensive use of external suppliers, outsourcing all but a core of activities wherever possible. Other organizations may pursue an in-source where possible policy, using external suppliers only where absolutely necessary. Most organisations fall somewhere between the two extremes. Wherever third parties are involved, the purpose of this practice is to ensure that suppliers and their performance are managed appropriately to support the provision of seamless, quality products and services. Consider the words managed appropriately. The attention invested in managing a supplier should be proportionate to the importance the service provider places on the supplier relationship. Supplier management acts as a single point of visibility and control for all suppliers and supplier contracts. Amongst other things, this allows a service provider to understand the true value, costs and risks associated with each supplier. Organisations are able then to categorise suppliers accordingly. For example, strategic, tactical and operational or commodity suppliers. The more important the supplier is, the more supplier management will seek to create a closer, more collaborative relationship, working with the supplier to uncover and realise new opportunities to co-create value and reduce the risk of failure. Supplier management activities cover the full supplier relationship lifecycle, including 
creation and maintenance of the supplier strategy and policies, supplier evaluation, contract negotiation and award, managing relationships and contracts, managing supplier performance, contract renewal or termination. In many organisations, supplier management will need to work closely with internal legal, procurement and or commercial departments.